The representation theorem states that any linear function can be written in matrix form. So if we have a function that goes from Rn to Rm, we can say that if the function is linear, then it can be written in matrix form, which means that it has a representation matrix. So F has a representation matrix, which will also be unique. So the representation matrix, we call it A. And instead of writing the function in the form of f of x, we can rewrite it in the form of a times x. So generally, if the function is linear, f and a are interchangeable. Um, they're just used in different ways. So either we write it in function form on the left or in matrix form on the right as multiplication. And the representation matrix is going to have f of e1, f of e2, and so on as the columns. So e1, e2, etc. are the fundamental vectors, which we'll go through in a second. They're also the columns of the identity matrix. So for the proof, we have to prove it in both ways. Mainly we're going to be using the definition of a linear function. So a linear function satisfies two conditions, the homogeneity and the additivity properties. So the first property, the homogeneity, says that if you take any vector in Rn and any constant alpha, taking f of alpha x is equivalent to taking alpha times f of x. So essentially, with a simple example, we're saying that f of 2x is equal to 2 times f of x. So this is only true for linear functions. And the other property is the additivity property. So the additivity property says that if you take two vectors in Rn, If you want to take f of the sum of x and y, it's equivalent to taking f of x plus f of y. So with numbers, this is like saying that f of 3 is equal to f of 2 plus f of 1, for example. And again, this is only going to be the case for um, linear functions. So we're mostly going to be using these two properties to um, prove that the function is linear. So in the first direction, we're saying that the, uh, if the function is linear, then it must have a representation matrix. So we start off knowing that it's definitely linear. And um, if it's linear, and we consider the fundamental vectors, so the fundamental vectors are again e1, e2, etc. And the reason they're called the fundamental vectors or also the elementary vectors is because we can use them to come up with any vector that we want. So for example, if I take uh, any vector in R2, uh, let's say I want to take the vector 5 minus 2. I could easily get that as linear combination of the fundamental vectors in R2, which are 1, 0, and 0, 1, by multiplying each of those vectors by the, uh, the values that I have in my vector 5 minus 2. So I'd multiply the first fundamental vector by the first value 5, and the second fundamental vector by negative 2. And so if you actually do the multiplication out, you get uh, 5, 0 for the first one, and 0 minus 2 for the other one, so altogether you get 5 minus 2. So generally we can say that any vector x1, x2, and so on can be written as x1 times the first fundamental, 
fundamental vector, x2 times the second fundamental vector, and so on, depending on how many uh, variables you have. So we're going to now use this with um, our linear function because we can say that if every vector x in the form of x1, x2, and so on can be written in this way, then f of x can be written as f of x1, e1, x2, e2, and so on. So really all we're doing is rewriting x um, in a different form using the fundamental vectors. And uh, since we know that the function is linear, so it satisfies again the homogeneity and additivity property, first we can apply the additivity property, which essentially says that if we have a sum inside uh, f, we can split it up. So we can rewrite it as f of x1, e1, f of x2, e2, and so on. And here it should have been x then e n as well. Then we can also apply the homogeneity property, which says that if you have a coefficient, so in this case x1, x2, and x n, we can take them to the front and rewrite it as x1 f of e1, and then x n f of e n. And once you've done this, you can also go a step further and write this in matrix form. So we can write this as the matrix of f of the fundamental vectors. Multiplied by x1 all the way up to xn. So the reason you can do this is just by using the property of um, multiplication of matrices, because with matrices, when you multiply, you multiply the row times the column. So you'd be multiplying uh, f of e1 by x1. So you get x1 f of e1, then technically f of e2 times x2 all the way up to the last one. So it would give you exactly what you had before. And this matrix over here, that's your representation matrix that we call A. So we proved that we have a representation matrix and it's given by the functions of the fundamental vectors. Now we have to prove that it's also unique. So to prove that it's unique, we prove why it can't be not unique. So first we prove that, or we suppose that the function actually has more than one matrix. So we start off with uh, two different matrices. So we're saying that f of x can be written not just as a times x, but also as another matrix b. And we know that a is given by f of e1, f of e2, etc. And for B, we're going to end up with the same result. But first, we're going to say that um, instead of writing it in function form, we're going to write it in matrix form. So we write it as B times E1, B times E2, and so on. So just to clarify, this here is multiplication. Since we know that B is equivalent to saying F of something, then this will end up equaling f of e1, f of e2, etc., which ends up giving us exactly what we have on the left. And so in the end, there's no way that a and b are two different matrices. Um, a has to equal b. 
which means that A is unique. Now we also have to prove the theorem in the other direction, but this part's easier uh, because for this, we start off saying that we have a representation matrix, so we can write our function in matrix form, and we just have to prove that it's linear. And so again, to prove that it's linear, we're going to use the definition here with the homogeneity and additivity property. So we have to show that both are going to be satisfied. So now in the other direction, we have to prove that F satisfies the homogeneity and additivity properties. So we know now that our function has a representation matrix. And uh, remember that for the homogeneity, you're trying to prove basically that f of alpha x is equal to alpha f of x. So this is what we have to get to. And uh, we start off saying that if we take a vector x and a constant alpha, since our function can be written in matrix form, if we want to take f of alpha x, that's equivalent to taking a times alpha x. And in general, if you have a matrix multiplied by a constant multiplied by a vector, the constant can also go in the front. So we can rewrite this as alpha times ax. And the reason you want to do this is because now the a times x, we can replace that back with f of x. And this, so we just proved the homogeneity property. So essentially the idea is that since with matrices you can bring the constant to the front, if the matrix represents the function, then it must imply that you can also do the same thing for a function. And the additivity property is going to be pretty similar. So again, we're just going to be using the properties of matrices. So now we have two vectors, x and y. And what we want to prove is that f of x plus y is equivalent to taking f of x plus f of y. So again, we start off saying that um, f and a essentially mean the same thing. So f of x plus y is like taking a matrix A times x plus y. And here you can apply the properties of matrices and essentially distribute the A. So we get A times x plus A times y. And since a times x is like saying f of x, and a times y is like saying f of y, then we are concluding that the sum that was inside the f can essentially be split up into two parts. So this part's pretty straightforward. You're just basically saying that with matrices, we have these properties that we can apply. And since the matrix represents the function, then the function has those same properties. And so by proving both conditions, we proved that the function is linear.